welcome to Candidate Conversations with a Spokesman Review. My name is Ellen Dennis, and I'm the local government... Or, starting again. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Candidate Conversations with a Spokesman Review. My name is Ellen Dennis, and I'm the state government reporter based in Olympia. Next to me is Jonathan Brunt, the local government editor of the Spokesman Review, and we're joined today by Nick Brown, a Democratic candidate for state attorney general. Nick, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's good to be back. Um, yeah, so my first question for you is, um, I'm wondering if you're elected, what you would do to make Washington safer? Well, I think public safety is probably the top priority for the attorney general and frankly for a lot of elected leaders across the state. And it's it's one of the things that's been somewhat surprising to me as I've traveled across the state as a candidate, it comes up consistently everywhere. And really, it's one of the things that's been interesting to learn how much we have in common, frankly, because whether I'm on the east side or the west side, small towns or, or little towns, people are concerned about public safety. And I do think there's a lot of really important work that the AG's office can do. And let me just talk about a few of those. First and foremost, I think we need to be a resource for local law enforcement agencies and the community to try to figure out how we can help them address some of the challenges that they're having. There are consistent problems that communities are facing around gun violence, around drug trafficking, particularly the fentanyl crisis that communities are dealing with. And the AG's office can help assist when local prosecutor's offices ask for assistance. There's not a much direct criminal responsibility within the attorney general's office, but we can intervene and help take cases where the local jurisdiction or the governor's office makes those requests. And I want to make sure that we are understood to be a resource for those agencies. Second, I think we can do a better job of coordinating and working with the legislature to address some of the legislation that they're drafting and make sure it's easy to understand that both the stakeholders and the community and law enforcement understand their expectations and make sure there's clarity around those. And I think one of the areas where over the last few years the legislature has struggled is to make sure they're adopting laws that are easy to adopt and people understand. And I've, you know, been a lawyer now for 22 years, the vast majority of that time has been working on public safety issues. I've literally prosecuted hundreds of cases myself on firearms trafficking, on violent crime, on crimes against children, uh, a crimes that, company, uh, that are committed by companies, fraud cases, protecting people from identity theft, bank fraud. I've done that work extensively, both as an army lawyer and within the Department of Justice. And then most recently, as the U.S. attorney, have led multiple investigations and overseen that. And so I bring a lot of experience to bear. I think it's one of those areas where there's pretty big distinctions between me and my opponent who doesn't have any of that experience. And I want to make sure that I bring all that experience to the work down in Olympia. Uh, you talked about working with the legislature. Uh, you're, oh, uh, who would, uh, the current attorney general has uh, lobbied uh, pretty extensively for certain legislation in the last 12 years, including a lot of uh, gun restriction uh, type of laws, uh, you know, uh, Gun safety. Gun safety, uh, banning uh, the sale of uh, uh, you know assault rifles and so forth. Uh, would you continue that effort? Are there more gun control efforts that you think are important to, to pursue? Well, I think we all have to be really focused on addressing gun violence. Um, and within that umbrella of gun violence, I include both uh, gun crimes, so people that are using guns illegally, but also suicide deaths, which is the leading cause of firearm deaths in America, including in Washington state. And we as a state and as leaders need to be constantly um, working towards improving public safety and around gun violence. And so developing more uh, gun safety measures, I think is really important. Um, we have been pretty successful in doing that in Washington and it's saving lives. And you know, gun issues in particular can be very divisive for people. But I think that we should be very proud of our ability to save lives. And, and let me highlight something specifically. You know, during the COVID era, um, almost every state in America saw an increase in per capita suicide deaths uh, for a whole host of reasons. Gun availability being one of them, the stress and isolation that came with the COVID era. Washington was one of the few, if not only, states in America that actually reduced their suicide deaths per capita in the country. That didn't happen accidentally. Uh, that happened for a whole host of reasons, but in large part, I think, because of some of the laws that we had passed in recent years. The extreme risk protection orders, which removes temporarily guns from people's homes when they're a threat to themselves or others, um, that allows family members or friends to, to request th those guns be removed. 
that saved lives. We also passed safe storage requirements, which requires gun owners to safely store their firearms uh, in secure places, which slows down the incidence of suicide. So in the last few years, we literally saved hundreds of lives. And all of us, I think, are a degree of separation or two away from someone that has attempted suicide or committed suicide. And so if we can continue to pass new gun safety measures that saves lives, then we should absolutely do that. And there are more things that we can do here in Washington. And again, it's it's one of those areas where my opponent and I very much disagree. Is there a specific thing that you think the legislature should do? I think the most uh, interesting one to consider next is the permit to purchase laws, which the state of Oregon has implemented recently uh, and done so constitutionally, I would add. You know, as much as we get in this gun debate, there's often like your c- complaints that you're undermining our constitutional rights. But the, li- the rights and laws that have been passed here in Washington have all been upheld thus far um, and has been de- deemed constitutional under state and federal law. And so the per- permit to purchase law is actually one that I think is worth exploring from the le- legislature. That would do what? Uh, that would require you to get a permit to purchase a firearm, uh, much like you have to get a permit to do all sorts of things in, in the public space. And there's various ways that you can craft it, um, but it, it you know it goes makes people go through uh, an additional la- layer of checks and review to make sure that firearms aren't getting in the hands of dangerous and mentally ill people or people that have prior convictions. It's another layer of assurance um, that gives more oversight to to how people are using their weapons. And is there anything uh, with uh, the laws that have been passed here with like this uh, banning the sale of uh, uh, high capacity magazines and so forth that you would change as far as the enforcement that might come through the attorney general's office? Is Is there need to be an improvement in the enforcement in the AG's office? And if so, what would you do? Well, I think there needs to be an improvement on the implementation and enforcement. And the one area that I think is probably the highest priority is actually around the the ERPO legislation, the extreme risk protection orders. We have some counties in Washington that do a very good job of enforcing that law. And we have some counties in Washington that, um, for a variety of reasons, have chosen not to enforce that law. Um, And that really, I think, puts people at risk in their community. And so the AG's office, I think, should be providing overall guidance to local jurisdictions to make sure they understand the legal requirements of what the law does and does not require to make sure that we can do everything as a state uh, lawyer's office to allay any concerns they might have about uh, some of the impacts of that. And so that is the the one area where I think implementation is going to be really important. Um, This election cycle, it seems like some people have been surprised to hear just how many people work at the attorney general's office, 800 some lawyers. And if you're elected, would you work to increase or decrease that number? I know you previously mentioned you were interested in opening up a labor rights unit. um, And I'm curious if you would hire more people for that or just kind of move people to a different job. Well, you're right. It is an incredibly large um, attorney general's office and has broad scope of impact on people's lives. And it has grown significantly in the last uh, 10 or so years for a host of reasons. One, we're the only state in the country that actually requires all of state government to use lawyers from the attorney general's office. The AG's office can hire outside counsel, but all those lawyers become special assistant attorney generals. It's a role that I've served in in private practice and a number of times, but not every other state or no other state requires that. And so by its structure, we're going to have more lawyers in many other states. But we're one of the larger states per capita uh, overall lawyers and staff. It's almost a total of 1,600 people across the state, 13 offices, including an office here in Spokane. Um, and you know that has grown because of the work. It has grown because of the need. It has grown because Washington grows. And as Washington grows and there's more uh, government entities providing services to the public, They need more lawyers and legal support. So some of that is just organic. And as Washington is scheduled to continue to grow over many years, I expect that office will grow as well. I'm going to come in and take a fresh look at at the organizational structure to see how we can realign and readjust things to be a more efficient and better run office. I do want to create a new division around labor and worker protection issues because we have some real big problems of of workers being taken advantage of and, and worker safety conditions. Some of that work is happening now, and so it's not going to be necessarily hiring people to fill a bunch of brand new roles, but reallocating people from different positions, and if there's a need to hire more, that we'll do that. The last thing I'll say is that the AG's office is one of the few government entities that runs a profit, 
and it, we run a profit because of all the affirmative litigation that we do. And so some of the litigation that you know the public may have read about around tackling opioid abuse and suing drug companies, uh, those are bringing returns back to the public that are then reinvested in services for people. There's a whole host of affirmative cases where uh, the AG Ferguson and his team have recovered hundreds of millions of dollars on behalf of the public. And so even though the agency grows, uh, it often grows and produces more net benefit for the public. Um, in terms of the opioid settlement money and money going back to the public, um, it kind of seems like in a lot of places the opioid epidemic is getting worse. And I'm curious what you would say to people wondering where that money is being spent or if you have other plans if if you're elected? Well, I won't profess to be an expert on all the ways the money is allocated because I'm not currently in the AG's office nor part of state government. So uh, I know a lot of money is going directly back to communities. Some goes to pay for the services that it took to litigate those cases. Um, but we'll have to take a new and fresh detailed look about how that money is allocated. But I think you're absolutely right. We're we're still facing a crisis, not only here in Washington, but across the country around opioid use. Uh, and we're seeing a real devastating impact on fentanyl use as well. And fentanyl in particular is, is particularly troubling for me because of the impact on youth. And for many years, uh, Washington and Oregon were actually the top two states in the country for use overdose deaths. That is a stat we should not be proud of. Um, and we have to bring all sorts of uh, different types of government and community resources to bear on that problem and treat it like the public health crisis that it really is. And, you know, we just got through largely the COVID epidemic and the entire country responded with great urgency. Um, and I think we need to treat fentanyl in some of the similar ways. I was looking back at some of my predecessors in office, you know, when A.G. McKenna, a Republican, came into office, meth was the number one drug problem that Washington State was facing. And he actually created a fairly effective task force to try to address some of the meth problems that communities were facing. That might be an idea that we need to do as well in the next term as in the Attorney General's office. But to do that effectively, I think you have to have experience in that field. And fentanyl cases were the number one type of case that my office brought as the U.S. attorney in Western Washington. And so we took that very seriously, trying to prosecute drug cartels, bringing drugs into the community, and to hold people accountable for the harm that they were causing. But it cannot be just that approach. It has to be both the accountability piece and getting to uh, some of the root cause problems that we have around drug addiction, but we really need to think a, a double down on the efforts that we've had over the last few years. Is there really anything the AG's office could do about fentanyl, given that it is really, you know, the criminal cases are handled at the county level or in the federal level, not so much at the AG's office. So what kind of more specific things could the state AG's office do? Well, sure. And I, I think to get back to the point I was making at the beginning, you're right. The original criminal jurisdiction lies almost exclusively with county prosecutors or the federal government, um, but they can request help and we should be able to provide it where they need help. And if they don't need it, that's fine. Um, but I wanna make sure that we are available as a resource to take on some more of the caseload as, as we need. There's also a great deal of, of collaboration and coordination that the AG's office can lead on. And you know, one of the things that I did when I was US attorney immediately coming into the office is that we gathered all of the law, law enforcement just within King County where we were seeing really um, high incidents of violence to make sure that they were sharing resources and information. And, and I, don't wanna, um, I don't wanna overstate how important that is because so often the problems that we're facing are not simply in one city or one county, but they're multi-jurisdictional. And so we see bad actors coming in and operating throughout a larger regional area. And sometimes that requires leadership to coordinate the response and information sharing, to identify common trends and the like. And that is what you uh, need to do, I think, more actively. And you know, so my hope and experience would be to coordinate with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Obviously, having been the U.S. Attorney, I have a lot of great relationships with both the current administrations on Eastern and Western Washington and law enforcement in those communities, and to make sure the AG's Office is providing whatever resources we can to help improve that. It's not going to happen overnight. There is not a magic switch that we can do, but we should be really focused on this. And I do think there's a lot of state leadership that can help mitigate the problems. Um, this election cycle, there's been a lot of discussion about how Washington ranks last in the country for cops per capita. And you've mentioned in your campaign that you would work to increase the number of police officers in the state if you get elected. And I'm curious how you would plan to approach that. Well, I think what I've said in the past is that I definitely think we need more law enforcement officers in the community. It's 
it's not the AD's responsibility to do that hiring and, and all resource allocation. We don't administer money or, or have any direct hiring responsibility. But as an advocate for public safety, I do think it's important for the attorney general to make sure that we're um, advocating for that and empowering local jurisdictions to have a, a stronger voice in that, in that conversation. So I do think that's important. I think that is a way to increase public safety. But I'm also really mindful of simply having more law enforcement officers doesn't necessarily make us more safe. I think there are ways that more law enforcement officers can be a better resource, can understand the communities better, can tackle some of the cold cases that we have. And so I certainly think there's a huge benefit to that. But the state with the most uh, law enforcement officers in the country is not the safest in the country. Um, and so we cannot simply rest on that. The things that I truly believe that make safety sustainable are both law enforcement and, and accountability, but all the underlying things like housing, like jobs, like an education system, like uh, support services that get to people's root cause problems around mental health and drug addiction. Unless we also invest in those things, um, where safety is not going to be sustainable. You know, 97, 98 percent of the people that we put into Washington State Prison, they're going to get out one day. And we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to prevent them from going them or there in the first place or when they get out that they have a chance to succeed. And that requires all a real thorough investment in those underlying resources as well. And in those areas, the AG's office does a lot of work. Uh, we do a lot of work to try to support our mental health system. We can do a lot of work coordinating with local jurisdictions that are providing drug addiction services. And so although the original criminal jurisdiction doesn't lie exclusively or extensively within the AG's office, some of the things that make safety lasting and sustainable, the, there is more direct impact. Earlier this year, the legislature voted to approve the um, initiative that dialed back restrictions on police pursuit laws. Um, if that initiative had not been approved by the legislature and gone to the ballot, would you have voted to dial back those laws or would you have voted to keep those laws in place and keep restrictions on police pursuit existing? Well, we have a lot of hypotheticals there and I because of the sort of procedure of it. Um, I think what the legislature ultimately did was the right approach uh, to, to re-empower law enforcement to pursue where appropriate. Um, so if that same version of the law was on the ballot, I think I would have voted for it as well. Um, this is a really complicated issue and, and hard for people. Um, and, you know, there are um, a lot of pros and cons to allowing greater pursuits. And I think ultimately we landed in the right place. Um, we also have to recognize the impact of those laws. And, you know, just the other day, we had another death um, of, during a police pursuit of someone who wasn't involved. And so a, a vehicle's r running into uh, an innocent person. And so I think we as a, as a state and within the AG's office need to be continually looking at those laws to find if there's ways that we can improve it. Um, but I, I supported what the legislature did. And if it was on the ballot, I would have voted for it. And another uh, police reform um effort that was done in the last couple of years that has received a lot of criticism from the Spokane police is um, one that puts restrictions on police and in interviewing minors uh, about crimes and uh, not allowing them to waive their Miranda rights, that there has to be an attorney there no matter what. And do you have an opinion on that? Do you think that was a wise decision in the legislature to create that restriction on police and inter um, interviewing minors? Well, I think we should think about how we talk about this, and uh, we can frame it as a restriction on police, or we can frame it as a protection for children. Um, and I kind of defer to the latter. And youth in our criminal justice system and our criminal legal system are a wholly unique category. And I think we need to think of those uh, people, those children, those kids as a, as a unique category. And uh, because their brains aren't developed like adults uh, because they can be particularly vulnerable. I think we need to be doing everything we can to protect their rights in the same manner um, or in a different manner than we would for adults. Um, so I, I, mean, I certainly read the headlines around the bill and I've seen some of the concerns. And, and look, I, I've worked with law enforcement the vast majority of my 22 years, uh, starting when I was an Army lawyer, uh, working with military law enforcement officers. I did that extensively as an AUSA and extensively as, a, as the a U.S. attorney. I have so much respect and admiration for the challenge of their job and the danger of their job, and I want to make sure that I can be an AG that supports them as well. 
Um, but I also recognize that sometimes they need to have restrictions on, on what they're doing. And so I think ultimately providing more protections for children was the right approach. Um, you know, I'm not a legislature. I didn't hear the debate. I didn't read the bill extensively. I understand the top line issues there. Uh, and so, I, you know, because I'm not a legislature, I, I sometimes am hesitant to say how I would have voted on something because there's lots of deliberation and consideration and stakeholder work that goes into that process. But at the very top level, I think we should provide more protections for children. And we're also in the middle of a presidential election you might have heard about, and it's supposedly <laughs> very close. Um, and we very well could end up with a president who, if you are elected, would be a different party. And last time President Trump was in office, Attorney General Ferguson was very active in challenging many of his policies, very vocally, and uh, one of the most prominent challengers, at least in, in AG's offices across the country. How do you look at his record on challenging federal policies under the Trump administration? And would you do something similar, do you think, if, if that were the case? Well, let me, and I'll, I'll get to the current race, but let me just okay. put that aside for a moment. And I think philosophically, the next attorney general needs to be focused on defending Washingtonians and bringing cases um, or intervening in other ways where there's an opportunity to improve people's lives here. And so that's sort of the guiding principle for me. As a litigator, you do that if there's a, a benefit to Washingtonians, if there's a legal case to make, um, and if we have, um, if we're the right venue to do that. Um, sometimes you can bring a challenge, but it's more appropriate somewhere else, local level, different state, what have you. As I look back at the time of A.G. Ferguson over the last uh, many years and the challenges that he's brought, principally against the Trump administration, but also importantly against the Biden administration, you know, most prominently in recent years was suing the Biden FDA to ensure that abortion medication was available for women here in Washington. That was a successful suit that I also would have brought um, that I don't think my, my opponent would have brought. Um, but if the next Trump administration happens, and I certainly hope it does not, but if it happens, we need to bring that same approach. If there are actions taken that impact Washingtonians uh, that are violating our, our legal rights and we have a case to make, then absolutely. And, you know, I was serving in Olympia during the very beginning of the first Trump administration. And I remember distinctly when the Trump travel ban, Muslim ban, was put out. And at the time, I was working for Governor Inslee as his lawyer. And we all viewed that as a wholly unjust unlawful action taken by President Trump. And I coordinated and worked with the AG's office to ensure that we had a fulsome approach to that and response to that. And it was the first case in the country to challenge the Trump administration. And it benefited Washingtonians and indeed, I think, the entire country um, and protected people's civil rights and also reaffirmed that Washington has a lengthy history of protecting people who are living at the margins. And so if we see that same sort of action, I'll certainly bring it. Again, this is something that I think distinguishes me and my opponent because he is a Trump supporter, as far as I know. I do not think he'll be as aggressive and responding to the injustices as I see them. And that's going to be important on day one. And the election is 31 days away um, here from when ballots were come out to Washington voters. And we're going to be prepared when we take office in January to potentially combat that. But if President Harris is elected, and I hope that she will be, I'll take that same mindset. Uh, if there are things coming out of that administration that negatively impact Washingtonians and we have a case to bring, we cannot be afraid or deterred because of someone's political party if we share the same party. And so I'll have that same approach. Um, last time we spoke, you mentioned that you and current Attorney General Bob Ferguson are different in some regards. And you also said that um, your background in criminal law will kind of guide how you approach your job as attorney general if you're elected. I'm curious if you could expound on the differences between you and Bob Ferguson and how you would do the job differently. Yeah, I mean, well, every attorney general who comes in the office is going to bring his or her own experience to bear. And naturally, it's going to be different. There are things that I really appreciate over the last 12 years that that office has done. And I think we've talked about some of these last time, but you know, let me just highlight quickly a couple of them. They, they created a civil rights division that did not exist 12 years ago, and they have been really active of defending people's civil rights, their disability rights, their language access rights, um, all sorts of cases that have been brought by that office. It used to be that if you had a civil rights complaint, 
and you called the attorney general's office, they told you to go somewhere else. So they referred you somewhere else. And so I'm really proud of that. Bob and his team created an environmental enforcement division that has done some great environmental work, holding people accountable for damaging our environment. That's work that I think needs to continue as well. As I mentioned, I want to create a new division specifically around labor protections and worker rights to make sure we're addressing wage theft in America and in this state, to make sure we're holding people accountable that are having unsafe working conditions. So that's a new direction for that office or to build upon something that hasn't been happening uh, as a standalone division. But because my background is almost entirely in criminal justice work, I want to make sure that I bring that experience to bear, leading teams, leading organizations, doing really complex investigations, and empower that office to do more in that space. And I think that that'll be really useful. And I'm also a practicing lawyer. Um, you know, when Bob came in the office, he was on the King County Council at the time. Uh, and I think many of his predecessors had not been active uh, working lawyers at the time. And, and I, I think that bringing that mindset as a litigator and someone who's practicing law will inform how I change that office as well. But there's a great deal of, of good work that's happened over the last 12 years, and I think we should be proud of it. The Attorney General's office used to have an open government ombudsman. Um, that's a position that has gone away. But it used to advocate for open records, open, um, op open records, open meetings, and so forth. Would you be open to bringing that program back? Yeah, I. And my understanding is that it actually still exists. It just has shrunk a little bit. I, I don't know if the position. Um, has entirely gone away. But yeah, and I, you know, when I served with Governor Inslee, um, he had taken a pledge during his campaign for governor um, that he would never use the executive privilege to withhold records from the public. It's, it's a privilege that had been exercised by every single governor prior to him. But I'm really proud of our work to maintain that commitment. And we never once exercised it. As, as his lawyer, I was the principal person responsible for some of the records responses. And I'm really proud of what the work we did. I also served on the Sunshine Committee, which is its uh, um, not official name, but it's the committee down in Olympia that provides more uh, review and access around public records issue. And I'm really proud of that work as well. And I do think that it is really important for that office, the AG's office, to be as transparent as possible, uh, not only in our, um, our public records cases, but to provide a resource for other uh, agencies and local jurisdictions, more guidance, um, but also in our discovery practices to make sure we're holding the highest standards and getting records to opposing counsel as they're required. And so I definitely think there's ways to, to strengthen that office. And I and I and it's one of the things I think that makes Washington great. And so if there's a way to improve the ombuds office and be a better resource, then I'm committed to doing it. Um, I think that is about all the time we have. Is there anything we didn't ask about that you were hoping to bring up in this conversation, <laughs> Nick? Um, well, there's, you know, we could talk for a long time and there's a lot of really important issues. And I, I do think this is a really important election. Obviously, we have a presidential election, but all across the state and they're really important races. And the AG's office is, I think, one of the most important because of the broad impact that it has. And, and I think I'm the most uniquely qualified for this job. And so I'm hoping for people's support and appreciate the opportunity to share more background about me. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thank On you very behalf, much. On behalf of both of us and voters out here, we're so appreciative that you took the time. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be in Spokane.